Okay, so this is the first video on a series of lectures regarding the ENLS course. Here I'm going to talk about mainly about the airway management, uh, ventilation, uh, intubation, and I'm not really going to talk a lot about sedation, but uh, you can go to the uh, original article, which I'm going to leave the uh, bibliography at the end of the lecture, so you can go and read the the whole article in which I base this this video. Okay, uh, so uh, what are the main objectives of airway management? Uh, it is important that we ask to ourselves what are the main objectives because uh, we can get out of this. We can know how uh, what are some of the indications for intubation of these given patients. So uh, we should look for adequate oxygenation. So in any patients that presents with inadequate oxygenation, with abnormal arterial blood gas levels, or that we ha uh, see that he's having some trouble uh, ventilating, well, that's a patient that we should consider to intubate. As I told you already, a patient with difficulty vent in ventilating, a patient that is uh, using a lot accessory muscles of ventilation and has an abnormal arterial blood gas level, that's also a patient that we should consider for intubation. Uh, in patients that we want to preserve cerebral perfusion, uh, this is mainly important in patients with increased intracranial pressure uh, in which cerebral perfusion might be compromised. And uh, by intubating these patients, we can uh, adjust some parameters so that we decrease, for example, in a patient with a brain infarct, the level of edema that he will develop, or or in patients with traumatic brain injury, or in these cases, by lowering the partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide, we can reduce the level of edema, and so uh, we can accomplish a normal perfusion pressure in these patients. And also in patients uh, in whom we want to prevent uh, aspiration. This is mainly true for patients that have uh, muscle weakness, especially muscle weakness that involve bulbar dysfunction, uh, which doesn't have a good control of secretions, uh, have a suppressed cough reflex. Well, these are also some patients that we want to uh, consider in intubating. And so, uh, before we intubate a patient, we should uh, assess the airway and see if the it is going to be easy or hard to intubate that patient. And here is a mnemonic uh, to remember what things we should look for before intubating a patient to consider it a difficult airway and if so we should call a, a person with with experience. Uh, it is optimal that we always have uh, two providers when we are going to intubate a patient and one of them must be ex experience on intubation but uh, this is even more uh, important in patients that we uh, think they have a difficult uh, in airway or it's going to be hard to intubate and with the mnemonic lemon we can assess for those things that predict a difficult airway and L in the mnemonic stands for look and this is pretty straightforward. This is the things that are apparent, such as this patient with uh, micrognathia, patients with neck swelling, patients with brain, uh, I'm sorry, with neck tumors, Pati uh, this patient right here with this uh, neck scar. We know by just looking at them that we, that these patients are going to be hard to intubate and so we might want to have uh, experience provider with us when we are going to intubate these patients. Also, we can evaluate uh, for a difficult airway with the 3 3 rule, 3 3 2 rule, sorry. And this is uh, we should look if three of the fingers uh, can fit between the incisors of the mouth of the patient, if uh, three fingers fit between the chin and the hyoid bone or uh, two fingers fit between the the uh, hyoid point and the cricot cartilage. If they don't, if any of these parameters don't fit, uh, well, this is also a prediction for a 
hard intubation. Uh, and we can also assess the airway by looking at the open mouth and see the structures that we can directly visualize. And this is the Malampati score, where basically class 1 is a patient that is uh, generally considered to be easy to intubate. Uh, this is a patient in which we can vis visualize the complete cubula, uh, the soft palate, and the pillars. Class 2 is a patient where we don't visualize the pillars, but we see the soft palate and we see the whole uvula. And a uh, class 3 patient is a patient where we see the soft palate and we don't you see the whole uvula, but uh, we see the base of the uvula. And the class 4 patient is a patient uh, that we only see the uh, heart palate. And so uh, generally class 1 and class 2 patients are considered to be easy to intubate while class 3 and class 4 patients are going to be a really challenging patient to intubate. And the last two letters of the uh, mnemonic are O and N. Uh, o, uh, this is assessing for any obstruction or obesity. And N, neck mobility, this is important in patients, especially in patients with uh, cervical and spine trauma which we have to limit mobility in order to avoid a cervical spine injury or um, uh, any uh, injury yeah, to, the, to the spine, basically, in which we can produce more deficit. So before attempting, attempting intubation, as I told you, it is ideal that two providers are at bedside uh, and one of those providers should be experienced in airway management. Uh, we should elevate the head of the bed to 30 degrees, mainly to avoid uh, aspiration, gastric contents into the lungs. And we should consider pre-oxygenation, either with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. The parameters that we are going to use when we use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is uh, we are going to ventilate these patients for about three minutes with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation with a fraction of inspired oxygen about 100 percent a tidal volume of 7 to 10 milliliters of per kilogram of ideal body weight and a positive end expiratory pressure uh, of five centimeters of water keep in mind that this tidal volume is just going to be used in pre during pre-oxygenation the parameters change when we have the patient intubated, as we will see uh, later. Another uh, technique that we might use to pre-oxygenate the patient is with heated high-flow nasal cannula. Um, this is a pretty good alternative since we can still oxygenate the patient while we attempt to intubate him. And generally, we get a flow of 60 to 70 liters per minute. And so, uh, what are the special concerns regarding some different patients? Uh, we will review the, that more in detail. So, if we have a patient with neuromuscular weakness, when are we going to intubate a patient with neuromuscular weakness? Well, if a patient has a neuromuscular weakness uh, that is progressing rapidly and might soon take the airway or cause vulvar dysfunction, well, this is a patient that we want to intubate before vulvar dysfunction is uh, very advanced so that the patient can ventilate and can protect the airway. Uh, we can uh, consider also intubating these patients, as I have already said, with when they have abnormal blood gas measurements. And there are important considerations in this group of patients. We should avoid the polarizing agents in patients with uh, that have been immobilized for a prolonged period of time or patients with guillain barre syndrome. And why? Well, because the polarizing agents, uh, as the name implies, uh, they cause the polarization. And by the polarization, when there's the polarization, there's normally a leakage of potassium out of the cells that are being depolarized. And normally in a healthy subject, this uh, potassium leakage is just going to cause an increase in potassium levels of about 0 0.5 to 1 milli equivalents, which is not very significant. But in patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome or in patients with, uh, that have been immobilized for a prolonged period of time, in these patients, uh, the leakage is more severe due to the upregulation phenomenon of these receptors 
that weren't stimulate, stimulated before. So the leakage can be important and we have to be careful with this because uh, potassium leakage and the increased potassium level in blood can cause uh, arrhythmias and can be lethal for that patient. Also in patients with myasthenia gravis, if we are going to use succinylcholine, uh, we should consider using uh, two times or two and a half times the dose of that is normally given with succinylcholine. I'm not going to talk about here about the doses, uh, just these general considerations, but you, as I told you, you can go and look for the doses in the original article. Uh, what about patients with cervical spine injury? Well, uh, in patients with cervical spine injury, we have to classify them in two groups. Patients presenting uh, with normal level of consciousness that uh, don't have any ventilation abnormality, are ventilating normal, and, uh, and in the other group, it's going to be patients with a compromised level of consciousness, patients that have difficulty maintaining an airway, or patients that can ventilate appropriately. And this, and it is important to make this distinction because in patients that are awake and have a normal airway and are maintaining a ventilation by their own, we might want to uh, try to intubate and with an awake fiber optic intubation. Okay, and why? Well, because if they're awake, we can assess for any uh, neurologic deficit that develops during the intubation uh, because of some movement that we did during the intubation. And in patients with an altered mental status or uh, that have pro uh, already a compromised airway, uh, those patients we should do a rapid sequence intubation. Remember that the rapid sequence intubation uh, means that we are going to give a in induction agent which mainly is ketamine or etomidate and we give a neuromuscular relaxant agent. And uh, we also use manual inline stabilization in these patients. This means that uh, one of the providers is going to hold the head of the patient by both of the by both sides uh, to limit the movement that is uh, usually happening during intubation. Uh, these patients, when they come to the emergency department, most of the time they already have a collar in place if they are brought by an ambulance. So we might remove the anterior part of the collar uh, to facilitate the intubation because with the collar it is harder to open the mouth of the patient, but uh, we still have to keep in mind that we should do manual inline stabilization. It is very important in these patients so that we can limit the movement uh, of the cervical spine. Uh, what about patients with brain ischemia? Well, in patients with brain ischemia, we have to avoid hypotension. Why? Well, that's obvious. Uh, if we, patients become hypotensive during intubation, there's an increased uh, risk of brain infarction. Okay. Uh, Preferred agents for induction in these patients are ketamine or etomidate. Some physicians prefer ketamine because it has a sympathomimetic effect, uh, which prevents patients from developing hypotension. Okay, in patients with intracranial pathology, uh, there are two reflexes that happen during intubation that we should keep in mind, especially in patients with intracranial pathology. And uh, and we have to keep in mind that rapid sequence intubation limits the elevation of intracranial pressure uh, even in unconscious patients. So if we present with uh, unconscious patients, we should still give him the induction agents to reduce the effect of these reflexes which that can cause an increase in uh, intracranial pressure. And these two reflexes are the uh, direct laryngeal reflex and the sympathetic reflex which both cause an increase in uh, intracranial pressure and, uh, and there are some agents that help us to avoid uh, the effect or to diminish the effect uh, due to these reflexes which are mainly uh, lidocaine and fentanyl uh, but uh, 
we just want to use it in patients that are uh, normal tensive or hypertensive. We don't want to use them in patients with hypotension since we can uh, increase or decrease the blood pressure even further. And as I told you, this uh, might be of some concern in these patients. The goals of uh, treating these patients with intracranial pathology is we should uh, try to accomplish an intracranial pressure that is below the 22 millimeters of mercury, a mean arterial pressure of 80, between 80 and 110 millimeters of mercury, and the cerebral perfusion pressure that is above 60 millimeters of mercury. What about the post-intubation management? This is what we sh uh, try to accomplish in all of the patients that we intubate. We should try to maintain a uh, saturation of oxygen about 94% and to accomplish this we should use the uh, lowest level of fraction inspired oxygen that we can. Uh, we should try to uh, accomplish normal pH values in blood. Uh, tidal value is usually going to be uh, between 6 to 8 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. And the, the respiratory rate is going to be usually maintained between 12 to 14 uh, respirations per minute. But this might depend. Uh, if we have a patient that when he arrived, he had a respiratory rate of 16, and with that respiratory rate, he was maintaining normal uh, blood gas values with no uh, acidity and everything uh, we measured was fine we might consider starting with 16 uh, respirations per minute. And we should look to achieve a normal partial pressure of carbon dioxide. However, in patients, uh, for example, patients with COPD or patients that may have a chronic high level of partial pressure of carbon dioxide, we might consider not using the carbon dioxide as a goal and instead basing our approach on the pH or if we are going to to use the carbon dioxide level, we might want to look at this table, which tells us what is the expected or the usual carbon dioxide level based on the bicarbonate level at, at admission. And uh, it is important once we have a patient intubated, uh, the things that we have to take keep in mind to avoid ventilator associated lung injury. And uh, the groups that are at more risk of developing ventilator-associated lung injury are patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome or patients with previous lung injury. So in these patients, uh, what are the factors that are associated with uh, ventilator-associated lung injury? Well, high inspired fraction of oxygen. How are we going to uh, solve for that problem? Well, we should give, as I told you, the lowest fraction of inspired oxygen that we can in order to achieve levels of uh, saturation of oxygen above 94%. Another thing that we should avoid uh, is barotrauma, which is caused by uh, increased pressure. So to avoid this, we should uh, use low plateau, plateau pressures, which usually should be below 30 millimeters of mercury. Uh, bolu trauma, which is uh, basically caused by high tidal volumes, so we should keep tidal volume at about six milliliters per kilogram uh, in these patients, susceptible as uh, especially uh, susceptible patients, as I told you, patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, what about atelic trauma? Atelic trauma is caused by uh, the frequent open and closing of the airway. So in order to avoid this we should cite for a positive end expiratory pressure of 5 centimeters of water. And uh, here is the article where I base all of my information from. I hope you find this uh, talk helpful.